folks. Well, well, thank you for uh, joining us today for the program. And um, I want to say, so I don't forget, I want to say a special thank you to our uh, virtual guests. Uh, we had um, a number of uh, individuals who requested after we posted the abstract of the program, and then they saw that Larry Bodges was involved. We got all kind of requests externally who said, you must, you must make this virtually available. So um, anyways, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for those folks joining us virtually. We wish you could be here in person, but uh, we understand the distance is a, a little bit of an issue. But hey, we're about distance ed, right, and online. So, so my name is Larry Reagan. I'm one of the directors of the Center for Online Innovation and in, what do we are? COIL. Innovation and Learning. It's been a little bit of a long week, so bear with me today if you would. Uh, and I'm really excited about this program. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about how it came about, so and, and a little bit about the orientation of what we're trying to achieve. Kath, if you wouldn't mind, I might have you over on this table. That's problem coming in late, we call you out and say by name, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, First of all, just by way, and we're going to go around the room in a minute and do introductions. I think you'll be uh, pleased to hear the diversity of institutions represented and the types of people. What I am going to ask you is for your name, your institution, and your affiliation with faculty development. Is it your primary responsibility? Is it a, are you a support person? Just something very brief. So we get kind of an orientation to, to uh, who's in the space today. So. Um, I'll tell you, you, you may, I guess I didn't share this with you, but uh, one of our colleagues who was going to be a co-presenter with Larry, Aziza Elazoy from the American University of Cairo, uh, had a family uh, death last week and uh, was not able to join us. She feels, um, she extends her, her best wishes for a wonderful program and uh, we extend our best to Aziza and her family as well. So. Um, I, I, we kind of scrambled and I, I went to Larry and we had mapped out a bit of a game plan for how today was going to go and I, I went to Larry and said, okay, we've got to reshuffle. But Larry also knew that we had the institute going on this past week and I have to say I, how grateful I, I am that Larry stepped in, took it, bang, banged one out that's going to be terrific. So here's what we're going to do today. Here's the outcome of today's program. Um, we're looking for each of you to leave today with an idea or two or three about how we might do faculty development uh, in the future. What can we be doing differently to address some of the challenges that we have? And Larry just said to me uh, a couple minutes ago, and, and I don't mean to steal your thunder, but he said, you know, we don't know those ideas right now, but in a couple hours we will have new ideas. And I think that's really exciting. That's a, a great spirit to go with it. Through the collaboration of the group, we're going to generate some new ideas. So that's the intent of it. Um, from my perspective, very quickly, I'll tell you that our center, COIL, is, is an institutional-wide resource whose responsibility is to sort of instigate uh, innovation, instigate new ideas. And uh, we do that by a variety of different techniques, uh, one of which is to offer workshops like, like you have today in the hopes of bringing people together who might not normally find a way to come together and generate uh, new thinking and new ideas. So the fact that you've agreed to join us and, and give us your brain power, uh, as well as to contribute to new ideas will be really, I think, really fruitful for us today, okay? So with that, if you don't mind, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start with Maurice. There's a, a large number, if you would put your hands up when I ask you, a large number of folks who went through the Institute for Emerging Leadership in Online Learning this week here at Penn State. So, woo, yes. Well, you know what I forgot to tell you guys yesterday? Anyone else who's been in the class, close your ears for a minute. But you guys were the best IELOL <laughs> class we ever had. No, 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 in 2016. You were the best plan. So, so uh, uh, we also have a number of folks who've been in past years, and I do tend to use that. Uh, uh, there you go. Who else was in IELOL? Um, Brian, Larry, uh, Amanda, Jan, uh, David. Yeah, terrific. Nice to see you folks. And I know online we have a few IELOL alum as well. Wow. Uh, pretty impressive group. A great span of types of institutions, type of roles and responsibilities. And um, hopefully we're going to capture some of that energy and some ideas for today. So let me turn it over to my 
friend and colleague Larry Bodges, and away you go. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, before I get going, I just want to uh, shout out some thanks. Thanks to Larry for inviting me to facilitate. I assure you I have no innovations to share with you, but perhaps one to get us started. But truly, to piggyback on what he said, magic is going to happen in this room. If you just finished IELOL, I know you're fried. I know you're, I know you're gone. And if you work at Penn State, I know you're fried as well. <laughs> but in that very, very uh, uh, dark night of the soul, that's when the ideas come to life. So that's what we're going to be working on. And these are going to come from us. So if the ideas don't exist. I think we're going to walk out of here with a few. I also want to thank uh, Patty and Haley and Brad uh, for setting things up. They were in here early this morning. They make all of this possible. I walked in, and all of, the, all of the virtual rooms were set up. Everything was great. All I have to do is show up and say a few words and get everybody going, and, and I'm fine. So thank you very much. Um, and I also want to uh, introduce and thank my colleague, Brian Redmond. Um, Brian has a new job, so I asked him for a little bio blurb. So I'm going to read the bio blurb. Um, Dr. Brian Redmond is the program director for Penn State's organizational leadership degrees. He has been teaching and leading in online programs for the past decade, in addition to serving in several roles at the university. Um, personally, Brian and I collaborate on a lot of committees here at Penn State. We um, do proposals for OLC. Um, and I also know, which he didn't put down, that I think his number of teaching courses now online exceeds 100. So he knows what he's doing. OK. So um, I'm going to share with you very briefly a story about faculty development. And for the purpose of today, um, we can talk about faculty development in general for residential as well as online. But I really kind of want to think about the online piece because it's, frankly, it's newer. And it needs more work, I think as a profession. So when we think about it, uh, let's think primarily about online and all the different ways that happens. It could be strictly asynchronous distance online. It could be using online when you're teaching residentially and um, kind of blended things. So anything having to do with online. But I think the, the intellectual work around online faculty development is really yet to be done. Then we're going to just very quickly tell you about the opportunity that we have, which is code for I'm going to put you to work. That's the fried part. And then the project I'll explain that we're going to be doing. OK. So let me tell you a story. This is just my story um, of uh, what I think this uh, odd place that I've landed in my career. I started off uh, in early days. I started off being a uh, K-12 school teacher and an administrator and then a school principal. And I did that for 25 years and then decided to go into higher, higher ed. Um, I did the whole tenure track thing with educational leadership. And now I'm in online faculty development. And I'm just trying to figure out still where did I land. So I have a story about online faculty development specifically. And I wonder if it's yours too. So in the United States, in our society, in our universities, I think we pretty much accepted the fact that online education is here to stay. It's not going anywhere, partly because of the, I think, the access and the incredible social justice aspects of it. But from a university standpoint, also, not only if it's outreach mission, but it brings in lots of dollars. So it's not going anywhere. OK. So as a society, we're like, OK, online education is fine. Now, who's teaching? And how do they get trained to do that? I mean, and we all know that online education really suffers from poor instruction. So we are now have landed in this idea of online faculty development. And day to day, I work in a box. And I think we all work in a box. And the box is, how can we, um, how can we figure out what our boundaries are? How can we figure out what our uh, limitations and what our possibilities are. And the box is not a bad thing. The box is a good thing, right? So the box 
helps us frame what we do. The box is like a window. When you see through a window, you don't see all the other, and you're looking at in, from inside a house, you don't have to see all the other stuff outside as distractions. We see the, what the window frames. In my unit, we have goals, and we stick to those goals because this box helps us uh, keep to that goal. But when we have new ideas that come in, we have to figure out what ideas that we already have in our box that we're going to get rid of. So the box is a good thing. I think we all work in a box um, in general. But the problem is the, box is the box that a lot of us work in doing faculty development, and particularly online faculty development, that box isn't working so well anymore. It's too small. It's run out of ideas, I think. It doesn't have the political power it needs. It doesn't have the funding it needs. It, it, we, are, we are trying to do so much with so little that I think we need to sort of examine what are the challenges that we have and then come up with another vision for faculty development. So let me just talk a little bit about some current challenges. I'm going to give you a couple of them, things that challenge us trying to do faculty development, and if you don't do it directly, the kinds of things that you think about, or if you're responsible for supervising people who do faculty development, the kinds of challenges that you see. I gave a couple. I'm going to put a couple up on the screen. Um, but this is a time when you're going to just uh, say a few things. You're going to volunteer, and I'm not sure who's, if we have a mic runner or not. Do we have a mic runner? You'll do that? Okay. And then Brian will also say, so here, I just think we have a few current challenges. Ready? Here we go. Boom. I think one challenge we have is that the services that we provide are optional. Wouldn't it be nice to have faculty that? Wouldn't it be great if everybody was trained? Oh, I just, you know, because I know that there are a lot of faculty who don't want to do it, so if they were made to do it, they would see the light. <laughs> right? I'm not, even get, I'm not even getting into sort of the, 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 uh, the um, resistance that we all know that. Another challenge. Um, our work is not university valued, uh, universally valued in the university or elsewhere. I think faculty development is a wonderful thing, but if you can measure the return on investment, then you should be a billionaire. Because you can't measure what we do in any kind of real scientific way. It's all craft and faith. I think we're going to work on that, though. I think we're going to come up with measures in the next five or 10 years. But right now, um, it's not university value, uh, universally valued. And when it's, if it's not valued, it's not funded. And then the third challenge I think that we're faced with is that, particularly with the online piece, I don't think we really know what we're doing. I mean, we have a lot of craft knowledge. We have research that's being done. But we're at the beginning with residential faculty development and theories of learning and theories of teaching. We know that stuff. That stuff is very well developed. That's a great body of literature. But the online piece, and we know the teaching online is different. I'm not sure that we really have our act together yet. Not that we should by now, but it's still early days. All right? Does anybody? have a couple of just other challenges to this work that we do that I can come up here and type uh, so everybody can see. Jan, and there's a microphone coming to you, Jan. I would just like to um, add a couple comments about how the work is not universally valued. OK. Um, in so much as when we fill out surveys uh, that rank online learning, such, a, such as the US News and World Report, it, there, there's prominent question that asks whether or not faculty development is a part. Uh, if, if faculty are trained, is faculty development a part of your program for online right. work? So there, there is at least uh, um, somebody that is saying faculty development is critical to producing good courses. Can I just programs. add real quick to that? They're even asking if it's mandated. Yes. That's the important. Yes. So if it is and available. And whether or not faculty are compensated right. for it. So there is a piece yep. where we can say it's valued there. Yeah. OK. And so what I, I would put there is we have some external 
yeah. uh, uh, forces. forces. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. What else? Other challenges just to get just to getting this thing done. I'm not sure if this is too specific, but it goes with costs um, of developing the training content either in house or purchasing it externally. Okay. Great. So we have, we have um, no sticks and precious few carrots. Incentives always an issue. So okay, so um, I think one of the biggest challenges. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Is that faculty equals expertise? Okay, and uh, uh, change challenges that. And online is change. So it's really how do you balance that triad? Can I, uh, in, I, Terry, I just want to interpret what you're saying. This is just Larry talking. Okay. Faculty don't like to learn. And I, hey, hey, I'm faculty. I'm one of them. But this learning, we don't, because learning puts you into a place of unknown, and sometimes we don't want to be in that place. It's a really uncomfortable place to be. Thank you. Couple okay. more. Couple more. Okay, Brian. All right. Um, related to that, uh, Carolyn said faculty feel like they're already trained as teachers and don't need help. Um, Carol H. said uh, development tends to focus on the mechanics of the lesson submission. Okay. Uh, Angela Velez Solek said the people who need it most do not participate. Uh, adjunct faculty do not participate in institutions, do not encourage or incentivize them. Uh, Ira says, lack of time, faculty need uh, development that is job embedded with time built into our days for ongoing development. Okay. One, one of the things about um, the environment that we, we work in, you know, the technology and infrastructure is always changing. So. It's like if you're teaching in a physical classroom and there's an active construction project going on and people are coming in, taking things out, putting things in, um, <laughs> distracting your students. And, and so I think that's one of the challenges, you know, that, that you don't know what you need to tell people about because things are changing uh, so much. Did I capture it up there, Velocity, keep up with? Yeah. Something like that, thank you. How about one more or two more? Uh, I just get, so this is kind of a version of some of the things that have been articulated, but the the incentive structure at the university does not align to our goals of faculty development. So people are recognized for research more than effective teaching. And I think the um, the uh, it's easier. I think there's more scrutiny on, on online education of of of, of its effectiveness and an absence of that on the resident instruction side. And so we're there's not even a a comparison to what's kind of business as usual compared to what's happening in the online space. I agree. Um, I, I think I think that there's also uh, um, in in this line of work there's a sort of artificial division between the content of what we're helping faculty do and the process of teaching itself. That a lot of us are coming from backgrounds that aren't discipline specific, but are more general learn teaching and learning. Um, uh, focused, so we're, we're missing that division between uh, specific disciplinary uh, pedagogical needs versus the overall process of what online teaching looks like. Thank you. See how much work we just got done? That's, <laughs> and, you, and you thought you were just going to sit here. All right. So we have some current challenges, and we could have we could have done that for another 20 minutes, and I think the challenges would have started to kind of coalesce into certain areas. Um, so, so those challenges paint a picture, honestly, that's not all that like optimistic. It's like, man, we, we are trying to do so much under so many, uh, so many obstacles and so many uh, issues. And a lot of those issues and challenges and specific things we are actually going to articulate just in a couple of minutes here. And then we're going to break up into groups and kind of work on that. So the one idea that I have to present to you is this idea of, um, of vision. Because I think the box that we're in needs uh, disruption. And the disruption has to do 
with if we can just get him to, you know, trained, you know, we're okay. But I'm going to say that's not good enough. I'm going to say having faculty take a training or take one of our online courses or uh, meet the um, meet the U.S. News and World Report uh, mandated um, a metric is just not good enough. And part of our frustration is we're working so hard and trying to be so creative with all of these forces against us. And the thing that we're trying to do is just at the beginning. Here's what I think we should be working on. I think we should be looking at faculty who teach online and figure out how are we going to support them over 5, 10, 15, 20 years of their career. What does that look like? We know what essential competencies look like. We have best practices. We have checklists. We have all of that stuff. And when they're done, they're done. But one and done is not good enough. So what does it look like to support a faculty, a team, a program over the course of their careers? Because more and more faculty are going to be making their careers teaching online. So what does that look like? Just course after course after course after course after course, if we can even get them to the trough to drink? I don't think so. So I think, I think we need a greater vision to jumpstart us out of that little box, maybe get us into a bigger box, but we can swim around in that bigger box. I mixed my metaphor, sorry. But we can swim around in that bigger box for a while, OK? So here's the opportunity that we have today. We're actually going to be thinking about this. We're going to strategize about this. This is the one thing that I'm giving you. And I'm giving it to you on a very self for a very selfish reason. Because Drew and I, as part of our unit, this is what we're working on. We've committed to creating a program. We don't even really know what it looks like yet. But we're committed to creating a program as long as the university keeps supporting us, that will take that new online professor or that adjunct or whoever that person is and say, we, we've got you. We've got your back. And as we're figuring stuff out, we will help you figure it out. Because we want to see what does it mean to go from basic essential competencies to the golden age of master teaching online. We don't know what that looks like. And some of you may already be master teachers, master online teachers, or master teachers face to face. But I have a feeling that the online master teacher looks slightly different than the one who stands and delivers and does all that good stuff. OK, so we're going to start thinking about some strategies to fulfill this vision. This is the work that we're going to be doing. Now, you might say, hey, Larry, that's cool, but that's not my, that's not, I don't care about that. Let me make, let me make the case of to why this is still cool to do. Um, because if this is not your vision, and it would be understandable if it wasn't, going through the process of identifying the issues, the obstacles, the, the topics that are the, the key ones that are around this vision, unpacking them, strategizing, and then coming up with new ideas that we have never, never thought about before. We've got all the old ones. We're going to use the old ones, but we need some new ones. The actual process of that, I believe, is educative and applicable to, 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 other, to other visions and other strategies. I don't know if you're buying it or not, but that's, that's, that's what I think we're, we can get out of this. OK, so here's the project. It comes in three parts. Project one is whole group in this room, as well as all the folks uh, virtually. And what we're going to do is we're going to brainstorm, identify, unpack, and strategize what are the issues, challenges, obstacles, topics that we have to address if we are to begin to think about what does a career-long online faculty development program look like or effort or philosophy, OK? 
the idea is we will generate some we'll generate some topics right now. We have a couple that are kind of already cooked. They're cooking on a Google Doc, and I think we'll find a lot of overlap. Each group here then will start working on one of them. And if you're ambitious and we have the, the and it works out numerically, you can actually work on two. And you can look at what each other's doing because everyone's going to be on the same Google Doc. And, uh, and what your group is going to do is unpack that topic that, you, that, you, that you're given or select, figure out what needs to be done, start working on that Google Doc, as a, and then as a small group, then you're going to be reporting out. And the reporting out is really the most important piece because this is where we figure out what we've all learned together and what we can take away. Everyone takes away that Google Doc with every issue on it. And I bet there will be some great ideas on that Google Doc that you can take. Okay? So the first part of this, whole group, second part, small group. And if this thing all works out according to plan, magic will happen at about 5 till 10. Then the bathroom break will happen about 10.30. 10.40. Right, right, right around there. Okay? You with me? Thank you. Good. Because if you weren't, eh, <laughs> it's a hard time. Okay. So, let's go ahead and start thinking about, I have this here. Can we start thinking about what are the topics? And hang on a second here. Um, What are the topics that we need to be looking at in order to great start addressing a career-long faculty development program, thinking about 5, 10, 15, 20 years, the growth from essential skills to mastery, et cetera? Lifelong, lifelong online instructor would be learning how to do it myself without having my hand held every time I need something done. Okay, thank you. I want to say something about the adjunct instructors. They're increasingly teaching many of our classes, and yes. so I think the professoriate itself is changing. And so the idea of a development for a career, well, what does that career look like? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I think going back to the adjuncts, I think actually this is true of anybody, but I think it's a particular issue with adjuncts, and that is the motivation of the person who has chosen this line of work. Uh, we particularly, and I say that in the context of the fact that we particularly at our school are looking for people who are already working full time, very successful. Why do they want to come with us? We need to know that. Anton, I just have a question. Motivation and incentive, can I, can I put those two together? <laughs> Because mo I know motivation is internal. And I, I tell you what, you have the power of the pen. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Okay. I think the next question would be what would incentivize them. Gotcha. So certainly you have to know the motivation. Gotcha. Help, okay. You know, uh, yeah. Okay. I'll be real practical with my concern, and that's the resources, the money needed to do long term, lifetime professional development. Thanks, Jen. Kathy? Uh, mine probably goes could go underneath the adapt to changes in professorate, but the fact that people aren't going to be teaching it or may not be teaching at Penn State for their entire career. So how do you, you know, where are people coming in? Do they already have some of the skills. How do we assess that when they start teaching for us? But then also if we, it's not going to be a cohesive program if they're teaching in a lot of different schools. And how do you make it cohesive? Okay, so... Um but if there's an intellectually, theoretically sound program, we could, as you're saying, have people come in and do like prior learning, try to do some competency testing and say, okay, you belong here. And then when you go, we, you know, our obligation to you may probably end because we can't do that. Although in a perfect world, we would help everybody everywhere um, by the world of Coke. But, um, <laughs> But right, so we'd we'd have we'd have the we'd have the the concept there and be able to place people in. Right, okay. Get back to Brett and then Andy. All right. So I, I just want to add to what you said, Larry, there, and, and we, we approach things from a programmatic level 
and we say, here's a program, please come to it. What if we embellish that by having, I don't know whether you would call it an IEP or what, but, but we do what you said. We have individuals assess their strengths and weaknesses, and then we tailor a plan for them that extends through the university or trans universities, wherever they move to, it doesn't matter. They have this plan they take with them. Right. Sort yeah, of. Got Okay, just one thing about Brett's idea. So, and 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 uh, yeah. Kathy, we are talking about one-on-one -on -one advising, right? We're talking about de yeah. dealing with people one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Uh, two points. Um, contrary to your earlier uh, assertion, I think that uh, if you're going to do lifelong development, uh, you've got to mainstream it. In other words, it can't be just online education separately. It has to be uh, faculty development that is central to the teaching and learning enterprise at the uh, institution. So my second point is that the pace of technology changes so that whatever faculty development you're doing today, invariably, if it's going to keep up with the technology, it's going to be different tomorrow. Okay. So we want we want to build that stuff into the plan. Yeah, right. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So m my mind's in a different place on some level, but I'm thinking on a pra pragmatic level and thinking, well, what if we break down that curriculum that what we want them to learn into those smaller pieces, into those competencies, because we can take that, I think, out to the future so that they can build at the start and then go into that sort of mastery idea as well and it's only one that's only one piece of it so a curriculum that sort of grows with them over time yeah and so it levels can, yeah and it can insert those changes as time happens yeah. with the technology and new ideas and I, stuff. I love yeah. that idea and one it's not a pushback but one addition to that that if we're going to if we're going to work on that in anywhere in, in this group or anywhere else you know how you're going to break 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 all the competencies down and figure out when to take what we have no idea what that looks like Right? I mean, just in terms of theory, research, we have no clue. So that would be something that we need to work on is what's the scope and sequence of, of, of instruction, residential and online, uh, over the course of 10 years or 20 years? Wow. We're going to go to Brian online, then I skip Sasha, then Melissa. Brian? Yeah, we have a, quite a few good ideas online here. Uh, Angela says, who will mandate faculty development or will it be mandated? Danielle says, many of the adjuncts at my college have already been trained at other institutions, so we need to keep that in mind as well. Uh, Carol says, number one, we need to identify needs of new and returning faculty. Two, survey faculty to understand their needs and concerns, stratify results by years of teaching. Uh, Danielle adds, need a way to track who has had what level of training. And Angela kind of builds on that point, developing a means for faculty to keep track of development, keep track of how they're applying their development, a way to reflect upon different learning experiences, uh, like a development portfolio that's electronic and shareable. And Liz adds, shush. I know. Just I know. Shush I mean, it's, it's, these are great ideas. This is pressure typing here. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm impressed. And Liz no, says, you're not. Uh, encourage research and evidence based development uh, to stay abreast of best practices. Okay. Brian, um, Sasha? So, the question to go back to what Kathy said with you know, turnover and with the adjuncts, where will this be housed? Do we really need every institution to have its own shop? Or do we basically have third parties like OLC who then, you know, institutions sign up and that's part of the faculty development instead of doing it the same thing we did with learning system. It used to be everybody had their home grown. Right. And now we have about three that, that are really in so, place. So, so you're where, raising, where is this house? Right. You're raising a structural, quite like structurally, where, sure. organizationally, where does this go? It's great. Okay, this kind of falls under support, but the, we need to be able to establish an environment that makes it safe for them to try new things and fail, and a community of practice in a sense where they're all among their peers and they can leverage yes. each other. Awesome. I stopped typing, by the way, because I'm, I'm so interested, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll get the stuff captured. 
Uh, one peripheral challenge that I think we have to take into account is um, having effective measures of student learning outcomes. So we can't really measure the effectiveness of faculty development if we can't measure student learning more clearly. I agree. Can I push back on that? <laughs> student learning has very little to do with faculty effectiveness. Ooh, I don't know. What's What's the connective tissue between excellent instruction and student learning that's reliable and demonstrable? Hmm? No, I, I recognize so the challenge, but I also think that the, the faculty have an opportunity. I think part of what we're talking about is a cultural change. It's a change in what we value. And I think if the faculty are value, valuing continuing learning, we need to enculturate that into students as well. So as opposed right. to like, I pass an exam, a multiple choice exam in X course, we're right. talking about transferable, measurable learning, you know, across disciplines. Yes, yes. Um, that directly relates to faculty right. development. And I, I will be on her team for a minute. Okay. Faculty sometimes don't recognize how powerful they are, not just in knowing the content, but addressing students by first name, knowing their name, engaging the student, giving them robust feedback on an assignment, those things improve student success. Knowing that there's a writing center and seeing that student who needs the help and referring that student to the writing center improves student success. Instructors, and there's a lot of research on this, nothing like good teaching improves learning. So we can put bells and whistles. We can make amazing platforms. There are some things inherent in education that will never change, and that's the importance of good curriculum and amazing instruction. Yeah. And I'm, I'm with you on that. OK. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to say yeah. outcomes do matter, and it could be usage. It could be the end of course survey, and you're looking at the degree to which students' perceptions of the instruction are good. It can then link to, and I know this is sacred ground, and I'm not asking everybody to go there right now. I'm just putting this out there. But you can link teacher effectiveness to student learning. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying people should be judged on the degree to which students pass courses. Right. But there is an obligation when you become a teacher to help each and every learner. And I don't think there's anything wrong with using that as an outcome. I completely agree with you. And uh, we're going to have time for like one more. But I'll just spend on that. that um, I'm, going, I'm going to pass the mic. OK. Yeah. <laughs> But just hang on. I want the uh, feedback on that. Um, I agree that we need credible metrics. The question for me is, what's the credible metric? To whom is it credible? And what does that get you? Yeah. Okay. I agree. Yeah. You okay for one more comment? Yeah, one more. Okay. So uh, I just want to clarify, Larry, because I heard a lot of interesting things being said. Yes. You do believe, then, that effective teaching can result in effective learning outcomes. Yes, you often can't prove it, though. Well, well OK. But right. if we could prove it, that we, but we often can't prove it. Our job is then to try to prove it where we can right. or show what relation. Right. Can. Because it seems to me, if there isn't, if we don't believe that, then we just ought to pack up and leave. Because then the question of how people teach seem to have no relationship to learning outcomes, and learning outcomes right. is really what it's all about. It's not about good teaching, it's about education. Yes, and, and, yeah. the, and I'll just go all drama on you and say, <laughs> if our profession does not get its act together and figure out what credible metrics are, we're going to start losing funding, right? The, oh, well, we don't have to do that because, hey, you know, people are teaching and some are great, and that's, you're a natural born teacher. Well, you don't need to learn how to teach online. Now, that's, dr that's dramatic. That's not may necessarily going to happen. But it's up to us to figure out what metric, OK? Whether it's teacher self-efficacy. OK, that's a place to start. It doesn't have a causal link to student learning. But there are, there are metrics that we can use, OK? So here's what we need to do. We need to switch. And I could go on and on and on. And I, this is fantastic. And I just, I am sorry I missed some of those things. But we'll get them on the, on the recording. Here's what we need to do. And this is the little um, sort of making it up as we go along part. You are all at separate tables. And the folks online are either in separate rooms or going to be put in separate rooms in a minute. Um, what I've done is sort of anticipated some of the things that you've said. 
and made them into some uh, broader categories. And what I'd like to do is uh, go through what those categories are very quickly and see if we can get some agreement on what group's going to work on just one of them. Unpack, strategize, come up with cool ideas in 35 minutes. Larry, can I ask yes. uh, just procedurally, uh, yes. some of the tables are large. Do you want them working in groups of uh, the large table or groups of, say, three or four? What's your we've preference? Got, we've got ten topics. Okay. So if people want to, uh, and we have uh, the folks there, so um, uh, the ten topics are all related to this, and they all fold into each other, so none of them will look crazy to you. Hello, virtual folks. We're back. So nice. I hope you've hung around. And we're very happy to see everybody uh, who can make it has returned back to the room. So this is the portion where we share all the goodies. Um, I took a look at the Google Doc, and uh, it's pretty amazing. Now, I know it's got stuff all over the place, and the ideas and not every format is exactly the same. But in terms of the quality of ideas, very, very exciting. So we have about, you know, 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so to do a good thorough report out and we can discuss along the way. Um, uh, I want to still, if, if one group's reporting, I want other people to be able to comment as, as they feel led. So uh, the way that this will work out is the one person who's reporting can basically tell us what, the issue, what were the sub-issues in your topic. How did you kind of unpack them? What are some of the strategies you came up with? And um, and I'll uh, and if you if you want to um, go on the Google Doc and sort of highlight them, um, let us know what the uh, one or two main awesome ideas that you came up with. Now, one thing to remember is you don't know this yet, but when we're all done with all of these ideas. We're going to come back to you in two weeks by email with this whole list. And we're going to try to boil them down into the most important and strategic and awesome innovative takeaways. But that's down the road. Right now, we just want to kind of get them out and see what you have. So we are going to start with group six for timing purposes. Um, and so why don't you go ahead Who's and uh, six? right ah. there and let it rock. Okay. Yeah. Should we I, be at, should we go to your Google Doc and look at group six? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. So um, as a more effective way of, of kind of putting it all together, I'll do a quick story. Uh, Melissa and I both are, are have similar experiences. We're, we're dealing with um, uh, faculty in the hard sciences. And one of the things that's for a long time now has been a real issue is putting a lab online. There's real resistance to that. And so what we were And that's a wet at, lab, dry lab, any kind of lab? Any kind of okay. lab. Uh, uh, physics, math, uh, uh, chemistry, chemistry in particular at, at my university. Um, and so what we were looking at was, was you know, how, how do we address the politics of that? Because I also come from a math department where they, just three years ago, they voted as a department not to teach in any room that didn't have a chalkboard in it. So, <laughs> um, so we we kind of, if I can jump down to the uh, to the strategies, we we very much see ourselves in 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 this domain uh, pedagogy issue as sales and support. Uh, you know, we have to we have to sell ourselves. We have to sell what we're we're trying to do, and at the same time, be be supportive of the changes that those faculty members are going to have to be uh, addressing. We have because maybe a few years ago it was a, a reality that that online labs just weren't up to uh, up to rigor. But that's not true anymore, especially with the advent of virtual reality, and that's a space that that I'm involved in quite mm -hmm. heavily and, and Melissa and I are going to be spending some time on that. So so let's let's take VR. How do we how do we introduce faculty members to how do we sell it 
and then how do we support it for them? Um, we we also have uh, you know show successes, encourage experimentation, um, facilitate relations with technological innovators. So what we're we're trying to do ultimately is create a community of practice where that professional, that instructor feels comfortable and 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 feel surrounded by, by peers and um, you very much see the community of practice model as, as the direction that we're looking to head. So with the establishment of that, let's say it doesn't exist yet in your, in your institution and you take the current technologies and the current practices and where all of the labs are or aren't in terms of the development of those things. But it seems to me the sustainable concept that you're talking about, which is the career-long concept, is the development of that community, where the community can teach faculty coming in. It's not always the developers doing that. Yes, so and, 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 and because of the rate of change, we're, we're, that's a domain that's just, I, I mean, literally weekly there, there, there are new additions to it. Right. To, to try and have a single expert or a single support person keep up with that and then, and then manage it is, is almost impossible. And it's, we very much see the community model as, as really the only way we're going we're gonna to have any chance of, right. of you know, that, that kind of, uh, of professional development. It's, it's sort of like, uh, what's, what's the famous saying about, you know, you, 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 jump off the cliff and, and assemble the airplane on the way down. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, much. we all do that. <laughs> but, but, but in a sense, yeah. that's what's really happening because yeah. we're, in a, we're in a space where that world is creating itself. Yeah. And so we have, to, we have to inhabit that world. We have to be part of that world in order to, to, to remain current. So one, one, one other question. So you have a, a community of practice of faculty who are taking it upon themselves to learn this stuff and teach new faculty who come in or teach faculty who are hired. And those of you who know about the community of practice model, what's your sense, just guess, may, just make something up, uh, what's the role of leadership in a community of practice model? It, I mean, it can be completely egalitarian, but are you envisioning in, in a community of practice specifically around these highly technical issues? that there is any kind of leadership model that needs to be in place um, in order, whether it's, you know, seasoned faculty teaching, you know, uh, less seasoned faculty or what? And I'm just, I know you just make it up. You know, think I think it's, it's leadership by, by credibility, leadership by efficacy. Find those, like, again, for my institution, and Melissa, feel free to take the mic at any point, but uh, in my institution, we had a math teacher, uh, Dr. Larry Foster, who sort of became a champion and is now in, in his math space, he's highly respected, but he's doing work that is very effective. They had a, a real issue, for example, with office hours. And, and we worked on developing an office hours strategy. If I had done that by myself and did not have Dr. Foster as the champion, there's there's no way that it would have, they would have had the same kind of buy-in. But, but, but it's very much a model where others look and see, yes, this actually works and it works well. Which is the incentive in that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Right. So it's a, you're thinking maybe a non-structured, non, uh, um, informal uh, leadership from the ground up. Yes. I would say one, one other thing, though. I, I come from the game community, the, mm -hmm. the online game community. Mm -hmm. You have to have a moderator slash facilitator, somebody who's behind the scenes, who's constantly sort of uh, making sure that that community is right. going in the places that it needs to. But it's leadership from, from below yep. or from within, not here's what you're going to do, not leadership over. But, but you do need administrative support. So, I mean, like in our college, our deans are supportive of these ideas. And I'll, I'll use Jan's group here. Um, Stan Smith leads the math department online. And he's got a really nice community going. And they, they work together. They share together. And I wish all of my 
departments acted like them. So I, I mean, if you have good examples and you have people who are really working and putting the sweat into doing this and making stuff happen, then it, it does work. But I think you do need the support of upper leadership to say, yep. yes, this is something we want to invest in. Good. And it seems to me, we keep getting back way to a comment Terry made earlier about faculty not wanting to, to um, they're feeling uncomfortable and they don't know something. Nothing is more fun than learning. So if they're coming to this community of practice and learning something very cool that helps them teach better, teach more effectively, um, obviously we want other incentives in there, but the actual act of a, of a person learning and it to be a positive experience is very cool, I think. And, and when that learning takes place um, among your peers, when that's yes. taking place among your peers, right. that, that sort of supercharges it. Exactly. Right. Okay. That was wonderful. Uh, what other group, thank you very much. What other group um, would like to go now? We want to just go down the list and go with group one. Shall we do that? Yeah. Group one. I'll thank you. One. And let me get your Google Doc up here so we all can look at it, even though people are staring at it. When we places. started, uh, we started by first uh, trying to identify what needed to be tracked, what we would want to track, uh, and then uh, how we would go about tracking it, and then how we would use the information that, that we uh, generated. So uh, some of the things, well, wait till he gets the document up there. You stop right there, is that good? Uh, all the way to the top. There you go. Go, oh, thanks. Um, some of the things we thought would be good to track would be faculty tra training, uh, what, what do they already have, what are their credentials, examples, do they have any certification, badges, that type of thing. Uh, we'd want to know what courses faculty have taught, when the courses were taught, tools that the faculty are using within their courses, uh, student completion rates uh, for those students that drop, uh, when in the semester are the students dropping. Um, as departmental uh, uh, information. Uh, anyway, at our institution, we have course designers that design courses for the faculty that come to us. I would want to know uh, uh, how many courses did we help to develop? When were these courses developed? How many times uh, has the course been taught once we've developed it? Who's developing it? Uh, and which one of the courses that we developed actually become certified in the end process. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we thought maybe dashboards would be a good way to track this information. Um, and faculty could utilize dashboards uh, so that they could see what professional development courses they've taken, what, what ones they would want to take. Uh, they could also, faculty a little bit lower down, could utilize the information on the uh, dashboards as a repository, I guess you might say, for mm -hmm. all the courses they've taught, when they've taught them, uh, what credentials they've, they've accumulated, um, and they'd have a record of all their online teaching history uh, through that dashboard. For administrators, um, the dashboard could be used to monitor and identify faculty that need training. Uh, it could also be used to determine uh, revenue used to get online courses developed. Like, for example, in our, our department, we spend a huge amount of money on course development because we have a large number of course developers that are doing this for the faculty. Uh, to determine if there's a less expensive process that would work better than uh, doing all the design for the faculty and not enabling the faculty to do some of the work themselves and determine other workshops training that would be needed. Um, so basically that's kind of what we came up with this. Uh, and we were starting to compose a list of possible reports to generate mm -hmm. from the data that we've gathered. That's great. So one of the one of the one of the harder parts of mandating that we should have everybody should be required to take faculty development. Great. But now you're gonna have to keep track of it all. Yeah. Right? 
And um, by the way, if anybody has a system to uh, 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 track, uh, let's say, faculty course enrollments and faculty training modules and certificate completions and um, uh, ability to report out to various colleges who ask, you know, which among their faculty are taking stuff, could you build it for us, please? Yeah. <laughs> you will? No. I said, I, us too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because we, um, we probably have, I guess, uh, maybe 1,500 enrollments uh, uh, an academic year. Um, uh, we we track everything by hand on spreadsheets mm -hmm. and three different places. Even a spreadsheet would be great. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mess. <laughs> we use training manager software, and it's definitely not the best. And there's well, I hope to find a software that's better. But one thing that it does do is it does do training transcripts, and we do get that request from faculty. Yeah. Send me all of the transcripts, and you know, in five seconds, I can send them either an Excel spreadsheet or a PDF of everything they're right. someone in the department has taken right. and what certifications they have. Right. And I would say, getting back to Melissa's point, in terms of administrative support for the cool things like um, uh, communities of practice, we do need administrative support for this stuff. It usually costs money or resources to develop that for faculty developers. It just, it's hard to make it up on your own. And so in terms of thinking about long-term uh, 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 faculty development experiences for, for a faculty, this stuff is super important because if you can't track what they're doing, and if you, can't, if you add an advising piece into this, where you're working one-on-one -on -one with a person, as we talked earlier about, you know, one-on-one -on -one advising about your, you know, what are your goals for the next year and what would you like to do, and you can't input that advising information into the record keeping, it's going to, it's really tough to keep up with, keep up with that. So can I throw out, I don't know if we have anybody uh, online from OLC, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, there are several organizations, OLC, UPSIA, uh, ELI, or a few that come to mind, that I think, and I'm going to go back to, I really like Sasha's idea uh, earlier, I think would, would have a sweet spot if they were to develop a mechanism, a, 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 let's just call it a universal system for tracking. Web -based. In, in yep. each, oh, of course, and each institution can create their own protected data. But think about what happens now when one faculty member moves to another. They pack up all of that stuff, and now I'm going to Clemson, and I take my, my, pack, my pack that I got at Penn State, and I map it over to the Clemson system. Wouldn't that be cool? I think, I think there's, a, there's a nugget there that's an innovative. And, oh, okay. Oh, Boss BC has the solution. I, I have okay. one more. I know, you know students have that with, a, it used to be a, like electronic chalkboard or something. Or, mm. Well, yeah, okay, here I'm going to give you. I have one more thing to say before we move on. I'm a firm believer and we, we can't move forward if we don't know where we've been. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that's why we spin our wheels. Because we're not looking at what we've done and we're just trying to move forward without any kind of foundation to build on. Yeah. So to me, this is this kind of information is critical to success. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the which what group? What number is your group? The interinstitutional. Way down here. Know, okay. The, way down. In I'm the going. Leads. I'm on my way. Uh, just one comment. I mean, some of these things that we talk about, we figured out for students. 150 years ago, they transfer credits all over the country. We have, I mean, you say, how am I uh, tracking certificates for faculty? Why is it any different than tracking certificate for students? Right? You know, you put them in the same transcript system and enroll them. But we have this interinstitutional professional development collaboration where we decided to solve all the problems that Group 1 came up with and recreate the OLC, basically. Uh, but the big idea, the big idea is this uh, is also, we, I believe, and we believe, uh, is figured out in a lot of other industries. There are all kinds of three letters that you can put behind your name that immediately let people know who you are. CPA, CFA, uh, professional project manager, and such. So we are thinking that that's basically what we need to do. Uh, set up an institute, or however you want to call it, that the, the key issues there is getting the buy-in, and the biggest, biggest issue of all is the credential recognition. 
so that we have schools that you agree that they will recognize this credential. So if it says Sasha Tomic, certified God instructor uh, of instruction, we know what that means, you know. Uh, so that really is the big idea. So mm -hmm. how do we get the buy-in? How do we get early buy-in from big schools and well-known schools? Because it usually is easier if we get the Harvards and MITs and Penn States and Clemsons and Boston Colleges to agree first than smaller schools who generally join. Whereas if it starts at the smaller schools, then the bigger ones kind of see it as, yeah, you know, those, you know, yeah. small cousins are fine, which is unfortunate, okay, but it's real. So how do we get this buy-in? How can we get institutional input into the curriculum and objectives without destroying the process? Uh, and how do we get the buy-in from faculty? Basically understanding this is something that you need that you can carry with you around. So again, I think it really boils down to figuring out what are some, again, three letters that we can put behind somebody's name mm -hmm. that will create this. Now Sloan, I mean OLC, is doing this and it has done this for a while. So how can we move it to the next step to where we, we leverage all those mastery classes, all of this to where we agree if it says master online teacher that we all know what it means and there is no need to educate my new employer on what, on what that is. Now, we say there are also, you know, when I say online OLC, that is online only. John uh, quite uh, rightly pointed out there are very vibrant uh, associations for faculty development that are on the ground and maybe convince them to also move into mm -hmm. some kind of certification because they already exist. And it, and it is not competition with the on-campus resource, but if we have these credentials, then schools that have centers for teaching excellence, because we know not everybody does. We are all very fortunate in this room that we are in institutions large enough to have one, that they can basically say, okay, fine, we'll train you for that certification. The same way that we tell master students, we'll train you, or accounting students, we'll train you toward the CPA, right? So yeah. our CTE yeah. can say, okay, we'll train you toward this credential from, from the association. Mm -hmm. But smaller schools can basically just send somebody to the course that the, institute, that the institute or association will run. And that might solve some of the issues operationally. All of the issues that were raised by administration, administrative groups still stand, mm -hmm. but they would be resolved within this third party. But, and those solutions exist. I mean, we've done it on the student side hundred plus years. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where we think mm -hmm. part of the solution lies. Interesting. What do you think would be the role for existing faculty development units in, in institutions if a lot of, let's say, the coursework becomes centralized, the credentialing becomes centralized, the record keeping of that becomes centralized so people can travel and go from university to university and still go up to the central, a central piece. Does that have, does that impact existing or planned faculty development units, or how does it? Well, okay, let me answer that um, a little flippantly. Do you know how many different courses are there for training for the CFA without being run by the Institute of Financial mm -hmm. Accounting? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the CT will do. I mean, first of all, you cannot have 17,000 credentials for everything. Right. We have to agree on two or three, you know, this person knows online teaching because they have this credential. Mm -hmm. So CTEs can train because not everybody wants to go to the institute or might not work very well and especially if you are dealing with something that's more face-to-face -face, right. then the CTE would offer local training on that. Gotcha. I imagine there are people that would still like hybrid training for an online certificate right. and plus there are all the issues surrounding it. However that training gets done there are still a lot of other issues. You can't train everybody for everything with this. Right. this and, and I think that's largely what goes on today. I mean, that, that CTs provide a lot of services that that are not all streamlined. And I think they would they would end work in that. You are just offering the streamlining for some very big chunks. Right. That, that gotcha. Cool. Good. And to maybe just start out small would be identify some common program outcomes that would could mm -hmm. constitute this group, uh, this credential. And so the, the teaching centers that have the capability to provide staff support and time and effort, they could be um, kind of the steering committee essentially for this kind of credential right. to be developed. 
whereas the smaller institutions without those centers could actually just pay a small fee mm -hmm. to just be part of that, mm -hmm. that process. Cool. Kind of like quality matters a little bit. Right. Yeah. Let me do point one other thing that we did not put up there. Almost all the outside certification that we know about, again, CPA being an example, have continuing education unit requirements. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's also where CPEs could come in. Right. And that is what makes it lifelong. Right. Because it's not one and done. Now I'm a certified online teacher. I might want to have this continuing right. education units to right. maintain to maintain that uh, credential all the right. time. And you, Thank you, know, you, Sasha. If I could just real quick, the idea that that triggered in my mind is um, an institution can certainly create their own faculty development um, system and and content related to their context. Right. We know that that's really important. Right. But if you had these CEUs that you also plugged into that you might not need to, let's just say it's discussion, managing discussion forums. That's a generic sort of universal one. It's probably not pertinent specifically to your institution. Then you link out to a, a CEU piece from wherever, let's just say it's OLC, and plug that in. That right. becomes part of your VITA then, part of your curriculum map as you're filling things out. Now, now it's more efficient for faculty development at a local institution paying attention to those localized contexts while you're utilizing, out, outsourcing some of the more right. generic stuff. Good idea. Um, yes? We uh, listen great communities of practice uh, experience here. Now we move to the creden credentials and like more formal and structured uh, side of the PD. How are we going to combine them? Because great learning can happen in learning communities that we may not be aware of and we may not give credit. So like... I know. You it's know? It's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. Okay, let's get to... Uh, can we get to an on... Uh, is there a on group of online folks who want to report out? And I don't know if they want to identify who they are. Okay. Who's this, Leah? Leah, did you say Leah Churchin? I'm not sure. No, you're not sure. Oh, Leah Churchin. Hi, Leah. Hello, Larry. Everyone can hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Well, I'm thoroughly enjoying this, even remotely, so thank you. We, um, a group of us, we talked about relationship management, um, or brainstormed about that in our breakout groups. And a couple of things that we determined were challenges were, number one, defining or assessing the needs. So not just assuming that because what we're doing as faculty support people, the latest and greatest is exactly what they want. Um, so this idea of meeting them where they are at. And um, yeah, you can see my name. is There's a little comment there, online members. That There you go. Um, the other thing is really just a, this idea of main, uh, developing and maintaining long-term relationships. So this idea of meeting with them once, um, trying to implement something, uh, something innovative in the classroom, whatever, and then just saying, okay, go at it, have fun, we'll see you later. Um, that type of model is definitely not going to be um, good for a long-term vision of faculty enrichment. Um, also, thinking about how to um, to get in front of them. Sometimes that's really difficult to do if you're trying to uh, get into their, you know, faculty meetings, <laughs> those sort of things. You might get five minutes. So, what are some ways that we can partner with the different departments to? start that conversation and then truly, authentically develop those long-term relationships with people versus, you know, oh, you get five minutes in front of us to tell us what you do. Um, so that was um, some of the things that we talked about were challenges and questions on how we can look at this in a more innovative way. Uh, let's see, one thing that we um, talked about, and I'm going to put a link in uh, the chat box was, you know, we always have our, what I call edge walkers, the people that are willing to 
go the distance with you, try something new, um, enrolling uh, all of your programs because the, the, they because somehow you have made that connection with them. They they've no uh, they've learned to you know no like and trust you, and they want to come back. So, and then you find out that there are other people doing things around campus, but you didn't really know that unless you had a conversation, which sometimes it's hard to have a conversation. So if you could develop sort of this like electronic network where you start to plug people in to the different programs that they've participated in uh, around campus or different campuses or even, um, you know, larger, like we were just talking about, um, inter-institutional uh, programs, then you can start to see the connections and then you can begin to determine which um, you know departments you've had more success with um, which ones that you would need to spend more time reaching out to um, that sort of thing um, so that kind of sums up what we talked about I believe um, Joel and Wendell were also really uh, and Carol they were all good parts of our group so if they'd like to add anything please do did the other uh, relationship management group want to go? Yeah, so uh, we echoed a lot of Leah's comments. Um, we did talk about how we tend to operate in, uh, as far as, you know, even IT, advising, support, everyone's kind of doing their own thing. So, so communication is coming back to that, getting those folks to talk with each other, getting the colleges to talk with each other. Because a lot of colleges, as, as Leah kind of mentioned, you know, they're, they're doing their own thing, they're learning these lessons, right. but then we're not sharing that out as a group. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about also we, we, we all tend to work with faculty one on one. Um, you know, the problem come in, we'll, we'll, we'll address it, but we're not doing that in a larger way. Some of that just comes down to ratio of staff. You know, we may have one instructional designer compared, comparatively for liberal arts, we have 700 faculty. You know, having that staff ratio to support them. Um, do we need to rethink the way we're teaching? We're kind of asking faculty to do more. Um, but we're not necessarily giving them more support. Is there mm -hmm. enough time in the day? Do they need to be paired with instructional designers? Do they need multimedia support? Do they need technology support in the classroom? Um, so, so thinking about that, especially as we move forward. Um, more understanding of the roles of everyone involved. I don't, I don't know that the faculty always understand what the instructional designer, that was mm -hmm. something we talked about, is you know, what do they bring to the table? What's the, the value of that kind of an education of the entire process? Um, where we come together, what is that point of intersection for, for everyone. Um, we also talked about relationships key and, and we're asking the faculty to trust us and you know we admittedly you kind of said at the beginning we're at the beginning of this so mm -hmm. mistakes will be made um, and I think we chatted about that and and kind of you know if the faculty takes a step out and then there, something goes badly or doesn't go well it kind of uh, uh, Renee, Renee made the point I thought which was good kind of inoculate you from openness to more experiences so so setting those expectations, allowing that option to, to do pilot projects and do them well um, is something we want to ta tackle. Certainly buy-in from the top um, is very important, uh, a structure that the university presidents, the chancellors, uh, the deans that, that help support faculty and staff. Um, the other thing I, I think our group kind of came up with, which, which I think was really valuable, is I think the faculty feel like they're being told to be, they're mandated a lot. And I think making it a choice and, and, and making it um, something that they can feel really positive about and that they can, they can opt into and, and finding that intrinsic motivation for them. We, you know, we talked about you know, a, a culture that, that in, uh, in promotes excellence and experiments in teaching. And, and I don't know that we have that yet. So, so moving towards that, um, uh, the value of the content, the technology always supports it, but it always comes back to the value of the content. Um, uh, we also talked about uh, availability of resources, mm -hmm. um, also, you know, understanding the student audi audience, understanding online cultures change, change for the learners, you know, what are younger and incoming students expecting? Um, Terry mentioned, you know, taking a visual concept, you know, and, and having faculty rework it. How do you, how do you teach a visual concept to a, to a blind student? Um, a veteran versus an 18-year-old versus a grandmother's perspective, uh, you know, something we need to take more into account as our student body changes. Um, and then we talked a little more about developing a strategy. Once you find a, a champion faculty, then you know, make them feel like a champ. Right. I mean, you know, really promote that. Um, we talked about equality among faculty um, and, and 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 tying, you know, a reward system that's more of a metric system. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and, and one of the other things I think that, that we identified that I think is very important is, you know, in many cases, I think faculty may feel like they're losing control of their classes. Um, and, you know, there, there, there's all these additional items. So, so helping them to feel that they maintain that control um, and, and finding ways to develop a community of faculty as well. Um, we talked about, and, and once we got into the strategy portion of this, creating an online faculty network, creating a, an online learning faculty network for all of us, um, creating a knowledge bank, uh, as, as I think a lot of the awesome. other groups have kind of yep. identified. When persons leave, we lose that. Um, so better sharing across the colleges as well as, as universities in general. Uh, and, and we did talk about faculty finding time to do this. How do we free up that faculty time? I think right. that's really, really important. We've mentioned that already. Um, uh, feedback, uh, you know, real feedback, uh, review tied, and, and letting the faculty get that, but get it in a very positive way, not, mm -hmm. not in a, a negative way, which, which, which happens sometimes now. Right. Um, and then ultimately encouraging faculty to do research in online teaching. Um, right. Thank uh, you. Incentives. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so in the interest of time, we just want to make sure that uh, we get everybody in. So if we could just sort of adjust the report out a little bit now, if you could report out sort of what the highlight was. What, what are the one or two um, ideas that you're going to take back or that you want to share with us? And is there a group that wants to go online, a, a virtual group? Okay. So next. Culture. Culture. Okay. Yeah. So just the highlights. The highlights are... Um, we had a really good philosophical discussion about culture and how to shape it, culture, and that culture was not just um, at one level. We talked about cultural institutions within units within the institution, departments, and also cultures within the discipline and amongst different um, types of faculty appointments. So our takeaway was that expectations um, need to be defined and articulated at the institutional level, starting with the mission statement, and then leadership needs to be able needs to ensure that these expectations are built into each level of the institution through the appropriate governance processes. Got more, but I can keep it that short. Um, got one more? One more idea? Um, unless there's a consistent top-down communication of teaching effectiveness and learning outcomes, we felt like little change would take place. So right. we just felt like it was really understanding that culture is not just a broad culture, but within broadly within the institution and within different levels within the institution and at each level leadership was very essential to be sure that the mission and the goals around teaching excellence and lifelong learning for online teaching needed to be articulated. I, I, that's great and we also know that the uh, one of the challenges of dealing with leadership at all of those different levels particularly the online folks who are working sort of at the ground level is that you're always managing up you're trying to teach the people who are making decisions for you how to make better decisions because they often don't know that. Um, another group? Yes. Okay, we are group eight um, and we looked at promotion and tenure, incentives, load, teaching evaluation, and dossier impact. So some of the issues and strategies that we talked about include, um, so the first thing was in most PNT documents there is no mention of online course design or teaching. We all agreed that this is a very slow process mm -hmm. and uh, but definitely needs to be revisited. Um, and for that to happen, uh, we need buy-in from upper administration so that it can be initiated. Um, and then, um, and this came from Maurice, uh, uh, we also talked about how a le legislature recommends degree completion time and this should be included in faculty handbook uh, specific to uh, degree completion time for online courses and online uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, uh, oh, that's degrees. Awesome. Uh, we talked about incentives, how incentives are uh, essential for course design, maybe not so much for course delivery but for design. Um, and then um, teaching load, online course design, sh online course, um, online teaching should be part of the teaching load, regular teaching load. We discussed how in some colleges it's an additional load that they carry and um, that shouldn't be the case. Um, we talked about teaching evaluation, how uh, when you teach entirely online, you, you are using online instruments and so um, faculty and administrators need to be open to the lower response rates uh, and even, you know, the, the, the feedback might be different. Um, we talked about um, how to do peer evaluation. Peers and department chairs need to be provided with resources to evaluate online teaching. Um, right now, sometimes you may not 
be teaching online, but you're expected to evaluate others who are teaching online. Um, and uh, we also talked about how um, teaching evaluation can be considered as a service. Um, we one, also or, one or two more ideas? Yes, two more. Um, and this came from you, Larry. We talked about a, a full-time... <laughs> he talked about, he came and shared with us how are we looking at models for full-time tenure track online professors, um, especially, you know, they might be on campus and teaching entirely online, but also a model where you might be remote, uh, but on a tenure track line. We talked about that. Um, we talked about um, policy, how policy guides the dossier, and so under each category we need some language uh, for online teaching. And finally, we also talked about uh, uh, if it is essential to have separate teaching awards for online course yeah. courses, or it should be just be built in within, you know, the common, uh, the broader. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, online group, yes. Got to sum up for uh, the online group with regards to leadership. And what was interesting, kind of as a you know objective observer of this document, is that how much it touches on all the other issues which you would expect the, the leadership. Uh, issue to talk about. Um, one of the main points was to have one designated one designated leader to lead faculty development for online faculty rather than multiple efforts um, and obviously needing to know what resources are available and uh, supports are needed. Um, training needs to be for all faculty including adjuncts and full-time uh, faculty. Some of the essential leadership skills and knowledge, actually, one of the suggested ideas was being an exemplary online teacher uh, as, as the leader um, should also have respect to, to in the, from the faculty in, for that leadership role, uh, similar to some of the trust conversations that we've had here earlier. Uh, being a good listener, flexible, adaptable, understanding of online pedagogy, um, latest technology. Um, there was an interesting conversation, actually, too, about the need for leadership theory uh, mm -hmm. specific to this domain. And I mean, I, I've never seen anything myself of this, but I did suggest some general leadership uh, theory for the group. But um, uh, a lot of one, one, more. Yeah, just potential approaches, things like um, defining needs, um, doing competency assessments, and then obviously following up on both of those and getting faculty involved with their own uh, development. Awesome. Larry, Thank can you. I add uh, one or two more around here? Because I, I think yes. this is a really critical piece yes. of the leadership, <clears throat> is what are the mechanisms that uh, faculty developers can get to senior leadership about some of these issues, working through faculty senate, working through um, special committees that might be yes. formed? How do you get these issues onto the table so that you're, you're advancing innovations within the context of the institutional culture. Right. And I just to piggyback on that, you know, the history of faculty development in general, um, when it first started, it was about organizational change. You know, so it was faculty development was seen as the core driver of organizational change and was very much integrated into the administration of the university. And then over time, it backed off from the administration because it didn't want to get tagged as part, you know, I don't want to work with you. I'm working with an administration. No, no, it's just us. So we sort of went into this isolated area where, it, you know, we were not colored by any particular um, uh, authority or group. And now I think we are moving back into having more impact on policy. And we, a lot of the faculty developers that I know at Penn State are on those kinds of cross-university committees where decisions are being made. So I do think faculty development in general as a profession, and online particularly, uh, is moving back into a closer association with administration. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I think that's the pendulum swinging back that way. Do we have another group in the room that wants to go? Okay. Hello, Angela. Hello, Ange. Hi. I, I actually. <laughs> Do you want to go to and Brett, please. and then we'll come over to this sure. side? Sounds good. Oh. Oh, Angela's up. Hello, Angela. Are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? We can barely hear you. We can barely you. have you. 
the, the people online can hear me, um, but I don't think you guys can. We can hear you. Oh, I guess I'm not going to add because I, I was part of this leadership group and then apparently I was moved to Leah's group, which is why I was completely and utterly confused as what Leah and Joel were talking about <laughs> because I was participating in uh, the administrative group. But since Brian already spoke uh, for us, I suppose I don't have anything to oh. add. Um, you're on a time crunch. But if anybody in the room is interested in any research on developing online leadership theory, we have email addresses in the doc, including my own, because I think that that would be a pretty substantial addition to the literature in this area. Thanks, Angela. Brett? Okay, so we're number two, the balance of focus on technology and pedagogy. And we came up with a number of issues and solutions, but I'll concentrate on two of them. The first is we're calling want versus need, which is many faculty come to training wanting only technology skills. How do we encourage them to embrace best practices and pedagogy for that technology? So a couple solutions that we came up with, uh, no surprises here on any of this, is start by talking to them and finding out what their needs are, what, what are their students not doing, what do they hope to accomplish by using the technology, and that can lead better into natural pedagogical questions. Um, what I call the wolf in sheep's clothing approach, start with the technology skills but integrate, integrate the best practices into the training. Um, offer sessions on the technology that broadly explain it, but then focus on the pedagogical uses of it. Um, that can be a gateway session in the deeper uses. Have a best practices showcase where faculty are showing other faculty what they've done. That can be within the university or trans university. That, ha that does happen, and it's, when faculty talk to faculty, it really works. And finally, provide faculty grants and support to try new things in conjunction with support from learning designers and other units. So that was the want versus need. The other one that we focused on was policy, and we really have no policies on embracing or enforcing best practices. Mm -hmm. Academic freedom prevents this. So, and then there's a little note here. It's interesting to note that academic freedom, which developed in order to protect free and open discussion on things, is often invoked these days in order to shut down just such a discussion. So, um, some of the issues, other issues, whether technology is being used, they can be a roadblock if the available technology is not what you want or need, and how do you keep up with new technologies and changes, and also the possible resulting changes from the changes in technology to pedagogical affordances. So there, this is a very broad solution. Uh, work with the administration to keep faculty members from all representative disciplines to develop a holistic and diversified plan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Uh, another group? Hello, yes, I'm Stephanie. I, I was working on the balance of rigor and complexity with just-in-time training. Awesome. Uh, and just as a quick background, of course, a lot of, a lot of the issues we've already identified, just-in-time kind of helps with because it's lower time for faculty. It's when they need it. But there are, of course, a lot of challenges that it's not as, as rigorous. You don't get as much nuance as you do in the, the more traditional approaches we've been using. So what, uh, what we came up with was is actually comes more out of corporate training where they work more with knowledge management systems that are adaptive to what it is you're trying to do. So my proposal, and I would love if anyone could work on this or would like to partner, is looking at an adaptive learning platform that either looks at what you're doing in the learning management system and provides recommendations based on that, or based on a, a teaching profile that you complete of what approaches it is that you, mm. you value and you use and therefore can recommend some technical guides as well as resources on pedagogy, articles, videos, whatever it happens to be. At the same time, I'd like this to be a knowledge management system where it's not only content directly from the teaching and learning center, the faculty development center, but where faculty who have become experts or, or gained expertise at least and experience in certain areas can submit their own resources and their own expertise in a really low time consumption way, whether that's recording a short video with a phone or a webcam or writing a quick couple pay, couple paragraph article on a technique so that you can capture that expertise, you can make it a little competitive among faculty so to see who has the most expertise because they really like building, I think Larry you called it brand recognition for themselves as this expert and you can tie it to um, the group next to me is talking about scope and sequence as well as the master. You can tie it to those pieces 
in order to recommend kind of what comes next? Or as a mastery, how do you connect with other people within your institution or potentially in this grand cross-institution system mm -hmm. with those from other institutions? So that wow. was what we came up with. Wonderful. Thank you. Next group. Hello. So we actually worked on scope and sequence, and it was a very collaborative effort um, on the team. But what I really want to highlight in this with this idea is that we would eventually start with um, you know, training and that would move to peer training that would move maybe to an OER. And um, this is really exciting to think of the scope and sequence when it relates to faculty training. So we have some really good information on the document. I'm not going to talk to, at too much length, but if anyone would like to collaborate at greater length, that would be fantastic. Um, the biggest thing that we talked about takeaway for you to take away is the idea of creating um, a sort of rubric. We were talking about color coding it, and as you move through the sequence, mm -hmm. we would talk about maybe incentivizing that and then becoming you know, a master teacher where you go on and do that some of that peer instruction. Right. Awesome. And we are also moving to that uh, where our cohort-based instructor-led training courses are taught by faculty who've taken our courses who are now teaching the teachers. So it's a that's an idea. Do we have any other groups who have not yet gone? Okay. Um, so my our, our topic that Shauna and I had is not as sexy, if you will, um, as as others. But we were looking at funding, um, and I'm glad that that we were together because uh, we were thinking on a multitude of things. So briefly, we were looking at it from a macro and a micro level. Mm. Uh, so the macro is dealing with really at a state level for our various states, what is it that we need to be selling in terms of our story so that we can get the funding from our states to do what we need to do at our individual institutions. And then at a micro level, we were really looking more at the nitty gritty of it. One of the things that I am Contending with is the, the concept of uh, faculty do get a stipend. Um, they don't get release time, but they get a stipend for doing course development. Mm -hmm. um, but I am in a funky spot then when I need to come back and do revisions to courses. And so because then I don't, I don't begrudge them, I'm a faculty member and I get it, they're you know, expecting some type of um, handout. And unfortunately, the system was set up by an administration that no longer exists and talk about building the plane while we were flying it, that was absolutely it. So they didn't think about scalability, they didn't think about the future of this, and so um, that's some of the, the uh, fun fun right. challenges right. Um, that, that I'm working through. Yeah. Thank you. And I think funding is such an important issue because most faculty development units, at least the ones I know, um, have all expense and no income on your budgets. That's, that's how we are. So we have zero income, all expense, and we're paid for throughout other things in university. And I think that's why you're seeing many people who have their own uh, stuff thinking about, well, can I commercialize it, monetize it, can I make it available to other people? Um, because uh, the, the funding issue is, 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 is tricky when you have expenses and you can't generate any income. Um, any other groups that have not yet gone? Wow. Um, so. <laughs> I'm going to thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to hand this back to Larry. What I'd say is um, during during the lunch hour, uh, and you may or maybe say this, but this is a great time to confer, to network. Hey, I want to work with you on that project. Um, to exchange emails if you don't have them, uh, or do the work right on the Google Doc. But keep this going, but in a much more informal way. And I want to thank you for your incredible participation. I learned a lot today, so thank you very much. And I'll hand it back to Larry. We also thank Larry for his, uh, thank Larry for his uh, uh, processing, moderating us through this. I, I think it's been incredible. We've got a ton of ideas. But here's the challenge. And I know I'm the only one between you and the lunch, so I'll be really quick. The challenge is how do you keep, how do you get some energy around these innovations? And it might be just like one or two things. So how can we keep this going? We have a great community. We had, I don't know, over 50 people who expressed interest in this. Is there something 
here that we could team up on. We'll get more done that way and actually, you know, move the ball down the field uh, since we're going into football season. So uh, again, Larry, thank you. I really wanted to extend my thanks as well to my team, Patty and Brad and Haley. Would you say thank you to them as well? They do a great job here. Larry and, and Brian Redman yep. uh, for monitoring our online group. Thank you. And I do want to remind you, we will be following up in two weeks. Okay, super. Uh, taking some of these ideas and then actually trying to maybe boil them down yep. into some uh, something manageable where a group could get really excited about uh, keeping that momentum yep. going.